So uh, maybe we will start with the guided meditation. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So let's do a bit of guided meditation. Is everybody here okay to do a Marana Sati? That is death contemplation type uh, guided meditation. You can put your hands up if you feel uncomfortable because it is not everybody's cup of tea <laughs> and it's fair enough if you're not quite ready. If that is the case, I can do a different type. But if there's no objection, then we can do uh, uh, that contemplation meditation for this evening. Okay, I don't see any objections yet. So let's get started by uh, sitting in a comfortable way. Um, it's really like, uh, th if you think about it, uh, if we are going to die soon, or if we are even going to die during this sit, you want to be really relaxed, right? <laughs> so in other words, we can look upon this meditation sit like, you know, really relaxing, relax to the max, like Ajahn Brahm says. So you want to be very relaxed as much as possible in your body and in your mind and be very present to experience this beautiful process. So, yeah, just make little adjustments and see whether any part of your body is tight. And if, if so, just uh, do a quick body scan and relax each part. So the idea of that contemplation is that this uh, death could happen any time. It could happen any moment. So when you make it very real, when you really trust that understanding, you feel that it could happen even before this sit ends. That's how how much we should take this on board if you want to have a good meditation and make much of this idea of Maranasati. So if we are going to in fact pass away before we end this sitting, then how do you want to guide your mind? Do you want to feel lazy, tired, angry, upset? No, right? You want to have a bright, uplifted, joyous mind as you depart. And do you want to be thinking about all these little things? Who did what, what you're going to do, even what you're going to have for dinner or tomorrow breakfast or what you're going to do on the weekend or the next week. All these things become irrelevant if death is at your face. So this is the beautiful thing about this death contemplation is that it makes your mind very quiet very quickly. Because all these small things that our mind just run into, which it runs into the past and goes into the future, all of these things and even our concerns in the present, it all sort of dies down. You want to really hold your mind in a good, beautiful way. So just have it, that idea in, in the back of your mind. Keep your mind as alert and as present as possible during this uh, 20 minutes or 25 minutes that we are going to sit. And then take quite a bit of time to just relax. And if it is your last sit, you also want to have gratitude and appreciation for your body. This is your last time being with your body. 
and your body has been very helpful for you since you've been born, doing so many things for you. Have you ever taken any time to say thank you to all the body parts? Usually we only remember the parts that are giving us difficulty and pain and sickness and usually don't have a good relationship, we are upset with our body. But there are many parts of our body that has been well and helpful. So if this is in fact your last half an hour to be with this body before you say goodbye, you would want to have a nice departure. So say thank you and have these feelings of gratitude towards your own body first. And gently extend that feeling of gratitude towards all the people who has been helpful to you during this life of yours. Really say thank you in your heart for all those things that you have received, really, that has been very helpful to you. I'm truly grateful. I have been fortunate. I feel blessed and uplift your mind seeing what went right in your life and keep your focus on that positive part of your life. That's the only thing that matters if death is at your face. Also, don't forget to relax your face and bring in a beautiful smile. Because you want to have a beautiful smile as you depart, right? And when you smile, it uplifts your mind once more.
And you can notice as your mind is filled with gratitude, joy starts to come up in your mind. And with that, your body will start to relax even more. So allow your body to really fully relax. But stay alert to enjoy being relaxed. In other words, not to fall into slop than topper, but rather be alert. You want to enjoy this process. A relaxed body is delightful. See whether you can notice the delight coming up in the body. If you are starting to feel enough joy and an uplifted, alert mind, then I invite you to gently remind yourself with every breath that is going out that it could be your last one. One day, in fact, it is going to be your last one. So why not now? And see what it does to your mind. If you're doing it well, you will notice the inner chatter. All those thinking will very quickly come to an end. So if you feel comfortable, then with every exhale, have the idea of it being the last one.
And as we are coming close to the end of this very short sit, take a few minutes to check your mind. Were you able to become peaceful? Did you feel some delight coming up in your body and in your mind? Are you feeling more alert and awake than when you first started? If so, ask yourself why. If not, also ask yourself why. This is how you become your own teacher and guide yourself in how to meditate, learn from your mistakes and your successes. If you wish, you can take three long breaths very slowly. And at the end of the last breath, the third one, you can open your eyes and come out of your meditation. I'm just curious, did you hear the bell? Because sometimes bells are not heard in Zoom. You didn't hear a bell? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, let me ask, after that meditation, did you realize, are you ready to die? <laughs> or not quite? <laughs> Whatever your answer is in your mind, I can really tell you the real answer that none of us are really ready to die unless we are fully enlightened, right? We have work to be done. So that's the real question, right? Real answer. Because very many people say, oh, well, I've had enough of life and I know what it's all about. I don't mind. It's okay. I'm ready to die anytime. We just say like that. But you know, life is quite precious. And what is this life about? Why are we here? Right? What is the main purpose? What is the meaning of this life? How to live a very meaningful life? This is what this is pointing to. Right? When you ask this question about, are you ready to die? That's what brings up. So having said that uh, earlier on as well, that it is a beautiful full moon night. Right? Today is a very special day. Uh, uh, it is what we call in uh, like uh, Uposata or Poya. Like it's a special night for Buddhists and especially for the Sri Lankans. It is because this full moon night was the night where Arahant Mahinda went to Sri Lanka and introduced Theravada Buddhism to the country. 
This is quite significant for us Buddhists because, as you know, a little after the passing away of Buddha, a few hundred years later, the Buddhism disappeared from India and it only remained in Sri Lanka. And why we still have Buddhism, the Theravada Buddhism for us available now was because of this significant event. So we, it is a, a day to have a bit of gratitude for for. for for having this beautiful Dhamma. But what this brings up as well, where did we have, where, where did we, how did we get a Buddha in the world in the first place? Now, this is another interesting question because this is the reason why we ended up having a Buddha in the world is because there was this young man called Siddhartha Gautama who was quite a spoiled kid, I must say, because he was a son of a very rich man. He had all the luxurious things. Like if you were to think about it from these days, he only wore branded clothes and ate very expensive, nice food. He had three mansions. You would know these things if you are familiar with the suttas and the Buddha's life stories. But, you know, he was also quite wise. One day he was reflecting, yeah, I have all these amazing, beautiful things in my life and I'm having a really nice, good time. But he realized, but, you know, I see people who are old and old age doesn't seem like fun. And I feel like I'm, I haven't gone beyond old age. I'm also subject to old age. So how, how can I enjoy life like this and be very heedless? And then he realized, you know, people get sick. And I'm also of the nature to get sick. I haven't gone beyond sickness. Uh, and this is also my predicament. And how can I just waste my time just only enjoying all these things? You know, the gratification of all these things lasts only a short time. You know, there's just beautiful music because it's it's said in the suttas that he had three heaven beautiful mansions and all of his attendants were only women. So he had a really, you know, very sensual life before he became a Buddha, you know. But he was reflecting still, how can I enjoy all these things when, you know, sickness and old age is coming and I'm going to die. Death too is inevitable. Once born, that is the only sure thing to happen, right? Life is uncertain, but death is definitely certain. And the most interesting part is that we don't know when it's going to happen. It could happen in another 10, 20, 30 years, or it could happen tonight, or even before the end of this time talk. Even I could die mid-sentence and you'll have to forgive <laughs> if we don't end the, uh, in this Dhamma talk. This is how real death is, right? This happens to people. We know people who died like this. Yet we forget this. This is the whole point, right? Even though we know that we could die for sure and we don't know when that is going to happen, in the back of our mind, even somebody who is 80 or 90 years old still has this idea of living for another long, 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 long time. This is the feeling that we have. Yeah, this is that. So the idea of Maranasati is to have in the back of our mind, life is short. So we must live life in a good way if it is short. So um, so it is not to bring up any fear or worry or anxiety or concern. Rather, when you think about this idea of death coming at any time, you actually live a beautiful life. You live your life to the fullest in the best possible way. And when you have this idea of death in the back of your mind, you also make amends to your mistakes very quickly, right? Because unless uh, there are any arahants on the audience, you know, we all have defilements in, in our mind. That's the nature of an unenlightened mind. And what is the nature of defilements? The nature of defilements is to make 
some silly mistakes from time to time. This is what the Buddha said. The Buddha said, if I were to say in Pali, when you have defilements in the mind, achakku karana, andhakarana, panya nirodhika, that means you, your eyes, you don't have eyes, achakku karana means you are like without eyes. Andhakarana means you are like in the darkness. And that is why when we ever we make a mistake, we say, oh, I couldn't see at the time. I couldn't see. I didn't, you know, I was blind. We say this, right? When we made a mistake, when, did, when we did something foolish, even this is what we say. Panya nirodhika means your wisdom departs at that time. That's why we behave like that. But we can't help it if we are unenlightened. From time to time, these things will happen. But the importance of remembering and reflecting on death and having that at the back of our mind is we don't wait too long to make amends. We very quickly say sorry to the people we need to say sorry. We ask for forgiveness from the people we need to ask for forgiveness from. And we give forgiveness. We don't hold on grudges. We fix things up as much as possible because what does it feel like? To die with a mind that is defiled. You know, this is what is there in the suttas again and again. You see, you know, where will be your destination if you depart with a defiled mind holding a lot of anger or regret, remorse, sadness, anxiety, worry, even strong desires. It's not good news to have these things in your mind. So, so therefore, you can see this idea of bringing up, you know, death. Our death can happen anytime. Makes you to have this mental restraint, the restraint of our mind. Because most of us Dhamma practitioners, we are quite good with our bodily conduct. We are quite restrained in our body. We don't go around killing people, stealing things, sexual misconduct. All these things are usually taken care of. We can improve our speech, but still, even the speech is pretty, pretty good for most of us. But it is our mind that is quite heedless, right? We allow it to think whatever it wants to. It goes everywhere. But it is the mind that is most important that we need to restrain because it is what we think about that breaks into speech and action down the track. So, but it is really hard because we have conditioned our mind to think in these ways for a long time. So these are habits and it is hard to break these habits. This is also why meditation is difficult. We sit to meditate and then our mind just go everywhere, right? This is very common. It's not just only for you. It is common to everybody. So, but, so this training is so important, so very helpful to really have this mental restraint. So this is why the Buddha said again and again, the importance of recollection of death, Maranasati. It is actually very, very helpful to have good meditation. In fact, the whole spiritual path can be seen as preparation for a good death. The best one being dying as an arahant, the fully enlightened one. And while you are doing it, if you if you die at any point, that's still going to be a better death than otherwise. Because you're doing your work. Isn't that a nice way to look at it? So it's not a way of bringing up fear, worry, concern, none of those. But rather you're focusing on how to live your life to your best ability. We can only do our best, so we will try. And as we become better, you can improve yourself even more. So this is a gradual path. So taking these little baby steps is about prepare, preparing for our death. So this is how we actually prepare. And it is also really important in the current day to understand, have a good understanding about death. Because there's a lot of people who also are unsure about what happens when we die, right? For us, this is a question that we have. We have some ideas, but we are never very sure 
what really happens when we die. And there are many people who have a lot of doubt about rebirth or even people who call themselves as Buddhist but do not believe in rebirth. But it's a very important question to reflect. It's not something unimportant. It is actually very important because, like I said, why we have a Buddha in the first place is because young Siddhartha Gautama, that young man, saw the big problem. The big problem in his life was not about difficult people in his life or the stresses of work or the finances or all these other things that usually overwhelm us and think as our suffering. The suffering that he reflected was the inevitable sufferings from old age, sickness and death. And with death comes rebirth. He realized it doesn't end there that you're going to be born again and again and go through this whole process over and over again. He had that understanding and that is when he realized I got to do something about it. So the whole Buddhist path what is the, the end? What is the whole Buddhist path in, uh, heading towards? It's about ending rebirth, ending this whole samsaric cycle. So can you uh, embark on such a journey if you don't have right view? That is right view, the right understanding that there is rebirth. So this is really important, right? It is really important to have a good understanding about rebirth. But also, Kamma and Vipaka, that is, take the causes and effects, right? You're taking responsibility for your own actions, the intentional actions by your body, speech, and mind have consequences. So these two things are part of the very essential part of right view. And right view is the starting point of the Buddhist path, like in the no Noble Eightfold Path, that is number one. That is the starting point. And you would know uh, again and again, you hear this from the uh, suttas, from Ajahn Brahmali, Ajahn Brahm, and uh, I'm sure Venerable Chanda, all of the teachers mentioned this, that the two cornerstones of right mindfulness and right stillness is right view and virtue. So having right view is really important. So understanding about what happens when we die, understanding and getting some idea about rebirth and karma is very important. So I also like to mention, uh, I, I also had a very um, good um, reflections and good lessons that I learned from a book that I read uh, uh, recently, some uh, not recently, a few months ago, and, and then maybe you have also heard about it and read this book called After. I think Ajahn Brahm may have me mentioned this because I read this and I gave that book to Ajahn Brahmali and he liked it and then he passed it on to Ajahn Brahm. I think he may have mentioned about it already, but it is uh, written by Bruce Grayson, who is a leading scientist on near-death experiences. So why I'm bringing this up is it's a really good uh, uh, a subject to have a good understanding about what happens when we die. So even if I am repeating what you have already heard, it is good to make it current for, for this Dhamma talk. So um, let me say a few things about uh, near-death experiences. So the scientist has been doing this work for about 40 years or more. So he has about a few thousand cases. And these are people belonging to various different uh, religions, cultural backgrounds, educational backgrounds, age groups, and belief systems. So for me, what was interesting was what was common to all of them. So if there was any few experiences that were common to all of those people who had a full near-death experience, then I would take that to be what happens when we die. So, and what happened and what is interesting is uh, a lot of these people, I mean, there were people who were just having materialistic view. That means that when this body dies, that's it, nothing happens. 
or there were people who uh, were, you know, um, not believing in any anything uh, uh, about karma, that there is good or bad, all these, you know, all different belief systems, people with all these sort of things had near-death experiences. But after their experience, their view changed. This is how profound even having a near-death experience is, right? Before I talk about the insight they had, just to mention that there are some similarities between a near-death experience and entering deep meditation, what you call as jhana. There are similarities, but also differences. But this is also an important topic because there is also a lot of misunderstanding about jhanas. And very many people put these very deep states into quite a lower state. But near-death experience is much less than an experience of a jhana. Why is that? Because when you enter jhana, your five hindrances are temporarily gone. Whereas somebody who's having a near-death experience the hindrances are still there. A lot of the times fear, worry, anxiety would be there present in the mind. And also a lot of those people who have a near-death experience do not have right view. But anybody entering jhana has right view. So you can see how the jhana is a much more profound mind state to somebody having a near-death experience. Yet, when if, if you read about these people's um, anecdotes, they have a very profound experience. They say, when the mind is released from the body, from the five senses, it is very powerful. And it is unavoidable. Some insights come to you, even with some hindrances still present. Even that experience. So you can see, when you have deep meditation, insights, Profound insights are unavoidable. So this is important to note. This is a side uh, thing that I'm saying, but this is important to realize about this. So what was the few things that these people who had a near-death experience realized is that they realized there is life after death. They couldn't deny it because they experienced that. And they also had a full life, full uh, life review that means they, the people who had a full near-death experience also remembered everything that they did intentionally, everything that happened in their life uh, from the time they were born up until they passed away. So what that did was they realized that there are consequences of their intentional actions. Whether they call it karma or vipaka, they understood that as an insight it's interesting right it is really interesting it doesn't matter what religion they were what belief systems they had what views and opinions they had prior to the experience but after having that and coming back every single person who had a full experience their life was never the same what was the main change that happened they all became very very virtuous they realize life was not about getting things done, achieving goals, but it is about how you do it. So this is the main lesson. This is how you really prepare for a good death. Good death is not dying as somebody with a big ego, having achieved many things, many perfect goals, but in the process, having really hurt many people, saying, this is not what I wanted you to do. This is not how it should have been done. You have wasted time. You have wasted money. <laughs> can you relate to these things? I'm sure you can. I can. <laughs> we all have been there, done that, continue to do that. We are task-oriented slave drivers on our own way sometimes. We are trained like that, right? Not to blame ourselves. This is the conditioning we have received in the modern education systems, in workplaces. We are supposed to be like that. Especially if you are a team leader, you see that happening. But what it did to me was, you know, I, I, I don't deny the fact I 
am. I used to be, I, maybe I still am a little bit, you know, used to be like a slave driver, a very task oriented person. And especially even when the Bachanda would <laughs> say this, she was there when I was doing the building project at Damasara. And it was not easy, you know, you're very focused, getting things done. And sometimes, you know, you can hurt other people's feeling along this process. I am guilty of that myself and I realize, you know, life is not about achieving things, but how you achieve. People are more important than getting things done. So after reading th this book, for me, the biggest lesson was that, that being focused on the people and being kind to them and how you get your job done. Even if it is not perfect, who cares? What is perfect for you today may not be perfect later on or to somebody else. And who would remember this anyway? It doesn't really matter. But what matters is your interactions with your people. Because this is what all these people who had a near-death experience said. They said for a vast majority of them, like, you know, your life is about your interactions. That's what stood out for them. Not the big events, not your graduation, not the birth of your first child or your wedding or any of these big events or, you know, seeing Ajahn Brahm. Some of these things will come up. They are big events. But your vast majority of your memories are about your day-to-day -day things. How you talk to the people at home, at work, when you go to the shops, your day-to-day -day behaviors, who are you as a person? And the interesting thing is you see this as a third person, like you're watching a movie where you're one of the actors, the main one actually, and you see how you talk and you see how you act. And not only that, the scary part for me also was that you're also going to find out how the other person felt when you spoke like that and acted like that. So this is a little bit scary uh, if you've been not good. <laughs> but it, it brings a lot of joy if you have been, in fact, good. I want to share a story from this book. There are many things. Maybe some of you have already read it. And this is the story from a truck driver. This, uh, this was a, a young man who was a truck driver in, in USA. And, you know, trucks are fast and it's really hard to break and stop suddenly. And nobody in their right mind would cut across a fast moving truck. But one day somebody did that and this truck driver managed to break and save this person's life. But he was really mad. So he sh really swears and used very bad words and yells at that person. At that time, that person whose life it was saved yells back at him. And that, the truck driver gets really mad. I just saved his life. He did the wrong thing. And he's now screaming at me. So he jumped out. He was a very angry young man, you know, with full of energy. And he punched this guy and left him in a bloody mess. That's what it says in the book. He got into the truck and drove off. Many years later, he had a near-death experience. This truck driver died. And during his near-death experience, of course, this was one of the memories because he has memories of everything that happened. But in that memory, he explains in great detail, he understood a lot more information about the situation that he, than he knew before. He realized, he had this understanding that that other person who crossed the road had just lost his wife and was grieving and was in the pub completely drunk. And then that's why he was out of his mind when he crossed in front of his truck. And he realized that he punched him 32 times. And that poor guy had internal bleeding, but he also felt how the other guy felt as blood was dripping down. This is incredible for us to even believe that you could feel the other person, how the other person felt both in his body and in his mind being punched at, at a time when he was grieving. All of that became his understanding. And we would wonder how is that possible? But you know, minds are very powerful. Even after having deep meditation, 
Parachitta Vijayana Jnana, that is knowing the minds, being able to encompass another's mind, is an ability of a powerful mind, a mind released from the hindrances. So it seems like even the mind released from the body has a lot of ability to encompass and know. So you're going to find out how other people felt with your words, with your actions. But the good thing is most of us also have been good people, doing good things, right? Helping each other. Sometimes you say, oh, that what I did was nothing. I organized that retreat or this Dhamma talk or shared a few things that I've been practicing with my friend. But you're going to find out how that changed their life, how they became a good person as a result of that. And that is also going to bring you a lot of joy. This is the positive side of that. So it's not just about the bad things, but good things also you're going to find out in great detail. So this is fascinating, right? So this is fascinating, but also knowing this information also really gets you to get your act together. You realize, you know, before you open your mouth, how is it that going to be? Yeah, how is my speech going to affect another? And this is this beautiful, beautiful um, advice that the Buddha gave to his little son, Rahula, the seven-year-old son. And if you want a reference, I think it is uh, Sutta number 61 in Majjhima Nikaya called Ambalattika Rahulova the Sutta. And in this uh, uh, Sutta, the Buddha says, the purpose of a mirror is to reflect, like in the same way, before you do any action by your body or by speech, or even before you start thinking about something, reflect and see, is that going to hurt myself? Is that going to hurt the other person? Or is it going to hurt both? If that is the case, don't do it. Sometimes we don't know this. So he, the Buddha says, and if you start doing it while you are doing the action or while you're doing that speech or while you're thinking in that certain way, also reflect back and see, reflect and see. Is that hurting myself? Is that hurting another? Is it hurting both? If that is the case, then don't do it. And after having done that action by body or speech or mind, Again, reflect back and see, was it hurtful for myself? Was it hurtful for the other? Was it hurtful for both? If that is the case, then don't do it. So this is a very simple way to find out how to keep your sila, how to keep your virtue and how to do the right thing. Because some things are very obvious. Obviously, when killing is never good, right? <laughs> Lying is not good. But there are times and there are some actions that are a bit gray and you are a bit doubtful. Is this the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? So this is a very good way to find out how to know whether it is the right thing to do or not is by knowing whether is it hurtful or not. And this is really a beautiful way to lead our, do our practice all the way, right? And if you're doing that, you're doing much benefit for yourself. Every wakeful moment, this is what we are supposed to be doing. Because every wakeful moment, we are, at, to the very least, we are thinking. So how are you directing your mind? Guiding your mind? Are you being heedless? Are you thinking all sorts of things that you shouldn't be thinking that are damaging to your mind? It is your own mind that gets damaged right? With the uh, uh, unskillful ways of thinking, even though it might be fun for a little while, it is very harmful for ourselves. And why are we doing that? And what happens while you're having that idea and that fantasy or whatever it is that is unskillful, you slip, you fall, you hit your head and you die. This can happen anytime as you get up from this seat and try to walk maybe to the toilet. This could happen, right? So that is the idea when you have that death might happen and, you know, unskillful things in the mind is going to be 
dangerous because you might have a bad destination. So therefore, when we reflect like that, we are doing much of the practice. Because that's another concern a lot of the people have. That is, we are very busy people. We don't have time to practice. And usually the practice is the time that you're either listening to a Dhamma talk and meditating, going to the temple, going on retreat. But that is the case, then we, then we will be all losers and no time to practice, right? It's, it's very little. But practice is really every wakeful moment. So that is why having this idea of death that could happen any time, what it does is it, it makes you heedful. You're constantly guarding your mind, guarding your speech, guarding your action even in your normal day-to-day -day life. And by doing so, you are actually living your life really well. Right? You'll be speaking words that go to the heart. Isn't that nice <laughs> to be able to do that? It is hard sometimes, but you'll be more, you'll have more incentive to do that because this is important, right? And you speak things that are helpful, not unbeneficial things, right? And uh, you uplift your mind. There's no time to be feeling lazy, tired, down, depressed. If these kinds of mind states are coming, you will find out how to deal with these things. Because there's no time to lose if that's going to come. So this is not to bring up anxiety and worry in anybody's mind because it is to encourage people to find solutions to these things. And it can be done. That is what the whole gradual training is about. It is just a talk to trigger that sense of urgency, sense of inspiration to take up this beautiful path that we have in front of us. How rare it is to come across these beautiful teachings and how beneficial these are to our life, right? It makes our life beautiful. It inspires, uplifts our lives and you live into its full ability, yeah? And it feels good. So this is what this idea does. So uh, there's so much that can be said about preparation for death. Because in fact, all of the Buddha's teachings is about that. As I said, it is about preparing for the best death being dying as a fully enlightened one. So uh, I hope if there are any future opportunities, we can continue those. In fact, even in the next talk, uh, we may be able to talk about those things that is about, uh, you know, um, living peacefully in the midst of chaos is about that as well. So we can build up on this subject. But this one is more about virtue. And I believe next week, Ayapasanna is also going to talk on virtue. So this is again, building up on this subject about, because this is really important, sila, virtue. This is the very first thing that we can do. And one other thing that is really important for us is our ability to forgive ourselves. So this is really, really difficult for some people. They are able to forgive other people, but forgiving oneself becomes very hard. But this is another thing that we learn from near-death experiences is that it is really important because it comes to you. If you have regrets, remorse, and unresolved business in your life, then we are in trouble. So that is another thing that does to our mind when we recollect death, is that we have no time to hold on to those things. So we have to, regrets and remorse have no place in the Buddhist path. Punishment, guilt, has no place in the Buddhist path. This is where Buddhism is quite different to many other religions. Because the Buddha understands we are conditioned beings. That's that whole idea of non-self. We have been conditioned 
by what happened before this life and past lives. So that is why we do what we do. So the idea, when you understand the conditioned nature of our actions, we are able to forgive ourselves and make amends. And this is really, really important to do. And uh, to have and clear our heart. For a lot of us, you might feel a little bit of tightness in the chest. And sometimes it's not big things. Sometimes it's small things, little things that you didn't do sometimes, or some things that some other person didn't do that's still bothering. So take some time at a good time to really um, resolve these things, because this too is really important. This is how you prepare yourself to your last moment. So, um, like I said, there's much that we can speak about this subject, but I will stop uh, the Dhamma talk here and open up for questions. I okay, just opened up chat, but there are no questions. So you can mute yourself, unmute yourself and ask questions. Or you can also say comments, agree, disagree. Everything is welcome. Yes. Yeah, Terry, yes. May, yeah. may I ask you to unmute, please? I'm finding really this, uh, I mean, it's all, it's fascinating. It's not death itself in of itself, but it's the dying process, which I find the most challenging. Um, and I've done quite a bit of palliative care. Um And I've also nursed patients who have not received palliative care, and it's been a, a chaotic death. But lots of medical interventions going on and the process of dying. The poor patient isn't allowed to die in peace, uh, which I find a, quite a cha I've always found it challenging. Yeah. So that's actually, thank you for bringing that up. That's a really important point. Um, and yeah, so uh, you can make your request, you know, as you know, you can make a request for yourself, how you would like the medical people to treat. If you are, you if you so happen to have your death in that kind of situation with some illness or in a hospital or with a lot of illness, then you can tell them what to do and what not to do. So it is really important for us practitioners that we are allowed to be a bit peaceful and left alone to go through our process because this is really important. If there is a lot of medical interventions and in interferences between people, that will have an effect. But if you are left alone and if you are able to be by yourself, still, how can you make sure that it is going to go in a good way, right? So there is a possibility. There is, uh, that is about this practice. So there are many things that we can do. And this is about our practice and the various uh, training that we do that kicks into place at the time of death. Because some of you may hear that what is important is the last thought moment. But this is not really a direct teaching of the Buddha, this uh, Chuti Sita and Patisandhi Chitta in Pali. These are from the commentaries, but it is not totally wrong either from dependent origination. We know that it's, it's the one moment is conditioned by the moment before. So there is some truth to it. But the important thing to remember is we don't have control over it. We can't really find techniques to see how am I going to really guide myself and control my last moment. 
you can't do it at the time. However, you can do the preparation now. So whatever you do now is what's going to happen then. So uh, I'm happy to share a story uh, from my personal life. You will hear this in other Dhamma talks. I've given in the same topic. But anyway, that's that's the only experience I have. So I'm going to share this with you. And uh, this is a, a time when I was young. Uh, I have gone on a uh, walk uh, with one of my friends. And this is a walk, not on the ground, but on the ocean. <laughs> In, in Western Australia, at the time I was in Western Australia, and this was when I was a lay person, there's an island called Penguin Island, where you can wade through the water into the island. So you walk on the sand bank. But as we were coming back, the tide was coming. And I was quite silly. I was young and stupid, so I didn't realize the tide was coming in and I got and I can't also swim. So that was the other silly thing I did. What was I doing in the ocean if I can't swim? But anyway, this is what you do sometimes when you're young. And suddenly I could no longer feel the ground, the bottom of the ocean. And so I was going to drown. I didn't start drowning. I managed to sort of, you know, use my head, legs and hands and try to stay afloat. But it was quite a, quite a time. So my poor friend was panicking and he can swim, but he's only a small fellow. So he can't just carry me and swim. They, then both of us will die. So I told him, you carry on and see whether you can bring some help from the mainland. I'll try and stay afloat. So I was trying my very best to keep my head up. And very soon I realized, well, my muscles are getting quite fatigued. It's quite a distance that he has to go and come back. It's quite a long time. I wasn't sure whether I was going to, I could see that uh, death is coming at me very fast. And even though I was a born Buddhist, I didn't know much of the Buddha's teachings before. So this was a time that I have just started my practice and I was thinking, oh, what a shame. I've just started practicing and now I'm going to die. So the thought that came to, well, what can I do? There's no bargain with death when it comes. You can't say, oh, please give me one more day. Give me a little bit of time. I'm not quite ready. You can't do that, right? When death comes, it just comes. So all I could think was, okay, well, if today is the day I'm going to die and this is how I'm going to die. I made a wish. Not that wish will do much, but I still made a wish and said, may I find the Buddha's teachings and able to practice uh, in my next life. But of course, you know, when you're faced with death, you'll do anything, even if you're a skeptic. So I remember the power of truth affirmations. So I also made an affirmation <laughs> made by the power of truth of the Buddha's qualities. May I be saved on this day? We try everything, but I don't know what worked. But anyway, the most important thing I want to tell you is that one of the things when I first started this practice was learning the qualities of the Buddha. Because as a, even a young girl, I was able to chant the nine qualities, the Itipiso Bhagavarhan. If you know the chant in Pali, I used to be able to chant this, but I never knew the meaning. But by this time, I have just learned the meaning. However, I have never done Buddha Nustati practice, like the, as a meditation, the recollection of the Buddha's qualities is a, one of the meditations. But I've never done that in this life up until this time. But it was very strange that at this point that I started doing this. Like when I realized that, you know, I've only got a very, very little time before I start going down and start drowning and dying. Uh, I actually started giving up. I started to give up because I realized, so having made that wish, maybe I'll have a good death. Uh, and I realized, well, I've lived my life to the best of my abilities. I haven't done anything that's terribly wrong. And I sort of gave up and my mind became very, very calm, very bright. Even though I wasn't dying, I also had this light. A lot of the people who actually have the near-death experience, they say, talk about a light. But I do also see, I did also see this light. 
And that is nothing other than your mind, as you would hear from Ajahn Brahm. Your mind, as it becomes very powerful, you see that light. And it became very calm, very peaceful. But I started to go through the qualities of the Buddha. As I say in Pali Arahang, I know the meaning. Samma Sambuddha, I know the meaning. So this just started to happen automatically. Right? And I became really, really blissful, really joyous and very, very calm at that time. So if I actually died, I'm very certain I would have had a good death. And this was what kicked in, in spite of me. Right? It happened. I have never done this practice, but it happened. So uh, why did it happen? And later on, I reflected and I realized that I may have been a Buddhist in my past lives. I may have done this practice quite a lot, which is why it came in, it kicked in. And surely when you read your suttas, you will see the Buddha says, Buddha Nusati is one of those practices. There are a few practices that the Buddha mentions. If you do it well, if you make it like your vehicle, and if you've made much of it, you get one guarantee. Because unless you are a stream winner, there is no guarantee where you're going to head. There is, you know, you don't know which destination you're going to have. Lower realms are still open to you. However, if you've done Buddha Nusati and few other practices that he mentions, your immediate next life is going to be a good one. Because your last minute, this is going to kick in. And for me, it did happen. So this is why I have confidence that if you actually have some of these beautiful practices, death contemplation is also one of those practices. All the Brahma Viharas, the Metta Karuna Mudita Upeka meditations, they are also some of those. So if you also take up some of these beautiful practices, they are going to kick in at the last minute. So you don't have to worry, but the practice has to be done now, this is how you prepare for your death. That is why I chose this topic, because there's very little you can do with your um, sense of self and will at the time of death. No matter how much you will think, I'm going to think like this and I'm going to guide my like this, mind like this. If you haven't done the practice, it's not going to happen. Whatever you have practiced, inclined your mind to is going to happen. And in my experience, this was not my practice from this life. But I may have done that so much in my past life. It was in the stream of consciousness that it kicked in even in this life when it was coming to the very end. Right. So this gives a lot of confidence in how important it is for us to take our practice seriously and take up good practices. So if that is the case, if you have done these things, then not to worry about that dying process. It's going to be okay. As long as other people are not going to interfere. So that part, you have to write. You have to write uh, in, you know, in every country. There's a different thing. I don't know what you call it in UK. Uh, there is something that you can organize with your GP and have it ready now. Even if you're young, I have done it myself. And my mother has done it. We have done it. And it is in place. So if anything happens, if you even have a critical accident or whatever, we have given clear instructions on how to treat and allow us to leave us alone so that you can actually have be peaceful as much as possible. Pain might come. All these things might come. But still, the last, very last, at the very last period, you're not going to feel your body. But your mind will still be there. And the mind, these things, these beautiful practices will kick in and carry you forward. So this is how you really prepare for your death. So it's really important. So not to worry about that pain, that anxiety, that worry. So this is why you prepare for your death already. And whatever else happens, it's going to be okay then. So, yeah, hope that was helpful. <laughs> And you might be wondering what happened. How did I? <laughs> because everybody's interested about the story. 
so I forget sometimes. So at that time, while I was so peaceful and going through this practice, I heard this voice, oi, oi. This is how Australians sometimes say, oi, oi. <laughs> and there was a guy on a kayak from the ocean side. Interestingly enough, somebody from the ocean side has come in and I very quickly went and hanged on to his kayak. And he said he wasn't very happy with me. He, said, he thought, what a stupid person who can't swim, who, who on earth goes out into the ocean at high tide. <laughs> but anyway, it was very kind of him <laughs> that I got into. Um, so my life was saved. And then by that time, my friend has also reached the mainland. And there, he also managed to send two other boys on kayaks and they came. And uh, I managed to get into them and my life was saved. But my friend was really surprised. He was really in a bad state, having swum and having left me in the ocean because we have been childhood friends for a long time. So he thought I would have died that time. So you can imagine what kind of mind state he would have had to just leave me in the ocean and start swimming and, you know, all of that. So he was in a really bad state. And there I was, really peaceful, really calm, very bright. I couldn't believe it. And at that time, I haven't started meditation. So I haven't meditated before. But, and I used to be a scientist. So I used to sometimes give the, you know, uh, talks and conferences. And when you are up on the stage and give a talk, you feel very alive, very alert. And I used to think that's when you are really, you know, alive and alert. But when I had this experience, when I reflect back, I realized when I'm on stage giving a powerful talk, it was like I was still fast asleep. That's how awake you feel. Uh, because it was really a beautiful state to get into. So this also gives an idea about how deep you can go in meditation and how helpful that is if you've done these kinds of practice when it comes to your last moment. So not to have any fear, not to have any worry, however it is going to happen. Even if it is going to be painful for your body, your mind will take care of it. So that's not a problem. <laughs> okay, so we are getting very close to the end. If there's any more questions, I'm happy to still answer one more maybe. Everybody is very contented, <laughs> reflecting. <laughs> and you can have questions next time as well after having reflected because we can continue on from here for the next topic. Okay, so maybe I will end it here and allow uh, you to, yeah. Thank you so much, Aya. We really appreciate your time this evening. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'm just going to send a message in the chat and then I'm just going to offer some words on Dana as well. So thank you so, so much, Venerable, for such a beautiful and serene meditation and your wisdom on life and death this evening. It's been so inspiring to hear from you and other bhikkhuni, and we are so fortunate to be offered the teachings of early Buddhism. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We are very grateful that Venerable has come this evening, or early morning for her, to give her time to help us with our two aims at Anakampa, to promote the teachings and practices of early Buddhism leading to full awakening, and help to establish the first forest monastery in England where women can take full bhikkhuni ordination. Thank you so much, Venerable, for supporting Anukampa. We are full of Karuna and Mudita and Metta for Venerable Chanda, who today entered her period of silence and contemplation this Vasa. She is currently in the US for a month and will be joining her Sangha for Vasa in Perth afterwards. And we continue to support the amazing project she commits her life to. All these teachings are offered in the spirit of dana, generosity. And if you are able, we are asking for your dana, generosity, towards Anukampa. 
We have seen the project flourish this year and wish to continue the, the support to the Bakuni Sangha in the UK and further afield and start raising funds to expand from our beautiful Vihara in Oxford to an even bigger abode to house even more Bikunis, aspirants and lay supporters. Without the support of the community here this evening and wider community, we wouldn't be where we are today, spreading the teachings of the Buddha to all. If you can, we are asking for monetary donations to support this expansion of Anukampa, however small or big you are able to give. Every penny is so gratefully received to support the Bikuni Sangha and get even closer to having a full forest monastery for Bikunis in the UK. Please do visit the website to donate and the link is now in the chat. You can offer a one-off donation or more regular monthly donations that will really support the project. There will be opportunities to offer food dana for the Vihara from December onwards and offer your time at the Vihara from the new year in 2024. Should you wish to offer these, please email team at anukampaproject.org. Please also see the Anukampa website for weekly teachings. We are being offered by the wonderful Bikunis and Ajahn Brahmali, supporting Anukampa while Venerable Chanda is on retreat, as well as Ajahn Brahm's teaching in, teachings in November and Venerable Chanda's retreats and talks she will be giving on her return in the UK, US and Norway. There's some wonderful retreats that we're being offered. Please do note that next Sunday will be at 9 a.m. Uh, British summertime with Venerable Pasana on Sila as a superpower. So thank you so much for your, all your presence this evening and thank you so, so much, Venerable, for your time as well. Thank you. Bye-bye.